Hey, this is Mike Dirksen from Proactive, and you're listening to the Building Bike Podcast. Tune in as we spotlight our guest, Parker Munt, Operating Director of Suffolk Technologies and Managing Director of the Boost Program. Our episode is focused on innovation in the construction technology space, featuring the Boost Program. For more information on this episode and others, please check out the Building Bite at www.buildwithproactive.com. Welcome to the Building by Podcast, a podcast for construction owners, contractors, and insurance professionals, where you can hear from the experts on key topics to help you be successful. My name is Mike Dearson, one of the show's hosts, and senior consultant of innovation and content solutions. Our guest today, the leader in the construction technology field, Parker Munt. Parker is the operating director of Subic Technologies and the managing director of the Boost program. Parker, how are you doing today? I'm excellent, Mike. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, we, we had a couple of reschedules, but happy to finally get you on here. It's a really interesting topic, so really excited to dive in. For our guests who may have heard you know, and think that the Boost program sounds familiar, uh, in our first season, we actually had the pleasure of talking with Alexis McGuffin. She works in Suffolk's business development program. And so today we're looking at a, a deeper dive into that Boost program, which Alexis had mentioned. So as we explore that and the process that as it takes us through, it's really great to have Parker on the show because he's going to give us that expert knowledge as we do our deep dive. Before we get into that, though, Parker, can you give us a little insight on your background, maybe how you got to where you are now with Suffolk? Absolutely. And maybe just, just importantly, by way of background, Suffolk is a, a $5 billion per year general contractor uh, in the U.S. We're headquartered in Boston, but offices span uh, to California, Texas, New York, uh, and a few places in between where we'll go build some exciting projects. So uh, we build across all asset class- classes. We have a focus in in commercial, uh, especially we also do a lot of healthcare and a lot of aviation work and some gaming work as well. So uh, kind of fully across the gambit. And um, I've been with Suffolk for about seven years now. I started as a career start, which is like a project engineer type role within Suffolk and was you know working on one of our largest jobs in Boston at the time, the Encore Casino and Hotel. And I was a superintendent there for about 10 months and then also was a project manager on that same project and then rolled into our commercial estimating group. So really got to see three facets of the construction industry uh, in just my first two years here. I took a little bit of a different path after that and transitioned over to work for our national COO uh, as his project manager. So got a little bit more of a purview into construction from kind of the business standpoint of things and more of helping run operations nationally, uh, which is really interesting. And then I took on another role, uh, it's something very similar, but but was you know, had a title of chief of staff. And so again, got a little bit deeper and more involved in kind of all things Suffolk on both the functional and the operational side of the business. And so really got to see, uh, you know, what makes this great machine hum and, and what helps us be, you know, one of the best builders uh, in the United States. And then shortly thereafter, I joined our Suffolk Technologies team, which was really just getting off the ground about two years ago. And I've been working as our operating director of Suffolk Technologies, which is the venture capital arm of Suffolk. And there's there's five of us on the team right now. So we have quite a bit going on uh, with a small team, which is just how we like it. And yeah, working as the operating director, a lot of my role is is really working as the connecting bridge between what we do at Suffolk from an operational standpoint with our construction teams and what we're looking at and investing in the construction tech world with Suffolk Technologies. And also spend a, a lot of my time with our portfolio company founders and helping add value to them and, and connecting them with people that are within the Suffolk ecosystem that we think would be beneficial. Yeah, it's really uh, quite the journey, Parker, to get from uh, starting from the construction arm and, and winding up on the venture capitalist side of the, the organization. So what was it that drew you over there? I mean, it seems like a really great opportunity that you're really running with. But was there something that just, it was a challenge? Was it, you know, just something new? Like what, what drew you there? Yeah, I think there's a couple things. One is I, I kind of have an, an insatiable appetite to constantly be learning and to learn something new or have the opportunity to learn something new, such as venture capital and start to understand software and technology and robotics and how that intersects with a very physical, often antiquated and mundane industry like construction was an extremely exciting opportunity for me. And also a, a quick anecdote, but coming as a, from a superintendent standpoint, I was helping run the mass excavation and efforts there at the Wynn Casino, which was kind of my first entrance into the construction world. And just tracking the 
carbon copy tickets of 18 trucks every single morning at 4.30 and then again at noon when the 18 trucks would roll back in and again in the afternoon. And we were also pulling 26 rail cars out of the construction site twice a day. And so having to track how much soil was leaving the site, where it was going to, what it was classified as, and doing that all quite honestly, on pencil and paper and carbon copy pink sheets and then uploading that into into an Excel sheet really opened up my mind. And so I started to explore the world of of software, what other opportunities were out there as far as kind of those young startup hungry companies that would be willing to, to dive in, roll up their sleeves and help us solve some of these issues. To me, it really hit home when I realized there's a great big world out there, you know, up into the five, 7,000 or so construction technology companies who are trying to solve the problems that are facing our superintendents and our project managers on a day-to-day basis. And so for me, it really hit home and it's been an absolute honor and a privilege. And um, there are so many folks within the construction tech world that um, I continue to learn a lot from day in and day out. So it's been a very welcome change and I will learn something new every single day here. So um, until that ends, I will be very, very happy here. I got to say, whenever we speak to someone who comes from more of the technology background and the, the innovation, the number one thing is they don't tend to like that, well, we've always done it this way, right? There are people who say there and go, what's wrong with that? You write it on the carbon paper and, and it gets done. Uh, so there, there seems to be a common thread within the technology and that innovation space saying, nah, there's, there's got to be something better there. And I think that's a great segue into our, our main topic, right, with the Boost program. And I know that Alexis gave us kind of a, a great overview, but hopefully as the director, you'll be able to really dive in there. And, and so if, I, if you could, you know, maybe give us an overview of, of what you think of the Boost program, and then we'll kind of dive into exactly how that challenges that question that we've always done this way and provides those interesting solutions. Sure. So the Boost program is uh, about to kick off its third annual program. So we've been at it for three years now with an accelerator program focused in the construction tech space. It's continuing to grow, has a snowball effect, which I think is is really a sign of the times within construction technology. There's a lot of folks who are trying to in- innovate in the way that we build. And, and really the purpose of the program is to ch- challenge the status quo and also to help companies solve a particular challenge. And so when we first launched the program, the idea was how can we be most effective and efficient in just six weeks of a program and make sure we are delivering real, measurable, tangible value to any company who gets accepted into the program in just six weeks while also being respectful of their time and understanding that these founders who are in our program are maybe fundraising, maybe trying to hire, likely trying to hire right now, which is it's a difficult thing in itself. They might be launching a first product. They might be iterating on a new product. They're trying to acquire more customers. And so we understand there's a lot going on in the lives of the founder. And so really, how can we assemble the right industry leaders and stakeholders and experts around the table and devise and create a program that in just six weeks opens up the aperture of our founders and allows them to connect with, build relationships with, and make real changes to their product or their offering within the construction space and leverage the experts that we have around the table and the experts that have always been a part of the Suffolk ecosystem and open that up for our founders to really be able to understand what we can bring to the table and then also make sure that they are iterating and creating real lasting solutions for the construction industry. So like I said, we are, so we are a six-week mini accelerator program Think Y Combinator of the built world. That's really what we're after here. Uh, We are super focused and we want to make sure that we are only selecting companies who are trying to innovate within the built environment. And in in that, we bring in, uh, last year we had 10 industry partners. Our first year we just had two, so you can see that that appetite is increasing year over year. So 500% increase, if I'm not mistaken there, Uh, which is exciting to see the growth of of the program. Uh, We've been receiving over 120 applications annually, so it's a very, very competitive program. And in that, we only select five finalists. Last year we took six, but we try to select five or six finalists um, who get to work with us for six weeks. And I think one of one of the things that, that's really most interesting about the Boost program is that they are actually partnered up with and paired with an operational team within Suffolk. And so instead of just having the interface be at the venture capital level, or instead of just having the interface be at the technology level, they come into our program and they immediately are paired up with a superintendent, a project manager, a project executive, and then also one of our construction solutions directors. 
at Suffolk who have, you know, been monitoring the landscape and understand more kind of the technology side of the house, but partnered with the folks who are actually constructing our buildings out in the field. It makes for a really nice, well-rounded program and helps these companies be extremely successful in just six weeks. And, you know, some, some things that, that we'll have folks come to us with. In the first year running the program, we had a robotics company out of the Bay Area um, and utilizing the, the Suffolk construction database that we have of all sorts of productivity rates. They were able to essentially run a robotic simulation just using our data, such as say, how productive do they really have to be in order to be just slightly below the price point that someone would be willing to pay uh, in order to perform that work on site mm-hmm. using a robot. And so we really try to deliver back true value to these groups. And right. what's great about the Suffolk program or the Suffolk Boost program is that it's, yes, it's six weeks, but really for us, it's important that we continue those conversations afterwards. And mm-hmm. so after the six week program, it's not like you're cut off and, and off you go doing your thing. And we really like to have long lasting relationships and make sure that we have a systematic way of continuing to engage with these founders and helping them along the, pro- the life cycle because six weeks is six weeks and there's going to be a lot of help along the way that we think we can add and uh, as well as some of the industry partners that we bring around the table too. Yeah. And it, it sounds like it, things are going really great, right? He says the third year and he's mentioned that applications are starting. So if anyone's listening that wants to apply, how do they go about doing that? So we have a, a few ways. One is you could always visit our website at suffolk-tech.com. And there's a link out to the Boost program right there with the most up-to-date information on the Boost 3 program that's going to be running this fall. Uh, And that's this fall, fall of 2022. Applications will open up in mid-June and will run until about the August timeframe. The program itself runs from early October until mid-November. So that's kind of that short six-week sprint period of time. And we encourage everybody that, that is an innovator within the construction tech space to apply you know, like I said, it is a highly competitive program, but even for the folks that are not selected into the program, uh, we are still very willing and happy to give feedback to that company and still also, you know, mm-hmm. monitor their progress and help them. And maybe we are just shaping them to reapply for the program the following year right. if for some reason this year it might not be the best fit for them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a relationship, right? And, and maybe okay. it's not ready yet, but there's definitely a relationship built there and you can, can build off that. So uh, you mentioned one earlier, but what are some of the successes? What are some of these innovative projects that you've seen so far in years one and two? And maybe what are you hoping for with year three? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there's, a, there's a couple I'll touch on. One is a company, another company out of the Bay Area, actually, who has developed an electric gen set. So they, their goal is to replace diesel generators on the job site. They're more mm-hmm. efficient. They're quieter. They're better for the environment. You know, there's a whole slew of reasons why this makes a lot of sense. Um, unfortunately, uh, you know, our diesel generators on our job sites that run a tower crane and a hoist are extremely powerful. And so for us to help this company... We had one of our job sites here in Boston over at MIT actually installed a system that they were actually monitoring the power output that was being delivered from our diesel generator to run both our tower crane and our hoist. That data was then funneled back to this company. It's called Moxion Power. And Moxion was able to take the data, understand what the average power output requirements are to run a tower crane and to run a hoist. And so when they've been developing their electric gen sets, which really are truly running off of electric uh, vehicle batteries, they were now able to design that specifically with the understanding of, yes, this could run a tower crane. Yes, this could run a hoist. And so they were really designing something to spec. Now, if they were not partnered up with a general contractor, uh, harvesting and understanding that data and information would be very, very challenging. So that was one of the things that we could bring. And for us, our team's really excited about it. Our project team was excited about it. The Boost team was excited about it. I said it, it was at MIT, and actually MIT is one of our program partners as well. And so they were very excited about the initiative too. And I think it's important to note as well, we've seen a massive groundswell of new uh, companies applying to the program who have some sort of sustainability or ESG at a more broad terminology uh, or ESG play, which for us is super interesting. And it's somewhere that Suffolk construction is double clicking into because we really, as a general contractor, act as the connector between new innovative technologies. How do they influence a job site? How can we build more sustainably and and create buildings that are no longer contributing 40% of, of carbon emissions into the environment? 
So that was an example of Moxie on Power. We talked about Canvas Robotics earlier with their robotic yeah. simulation. And I think one more to hit on, um, just because it, last year for us, it was extremely exciting. One of our companies, a company called Felix, it's a steel B2B marketplace. They were in the program. They are an extremely exciting, high-velocity, fast-growing company. And they actually signed a term sheet for investment with one of our program partners during the Boost program. And so if you're a founder, it's like you can come to us and say you need help with a pricing model. You need help running robotic simulations. You need help because you want some data that we've been gathering from our job sites for the last 30 years. Or you can come and say, I'm about to fundraise. I want to be connected to a bunch of potential VCs and fundraising partners, mm -hmm. and you guys would be the right way or right channel or avenue for me to do so. And so we've had a, a plethora of success stories over the past couple of years. But as I mentioned earlier, you know, we are very quick to, to continue to iterate on that program, and we want to continue to grow the program and one-up the program year over year. So most exciting you know, for us and our Boost team is looking ahead to say, who in 2022 is going to be or who are going to be is going to be multiple success stories that come out of the program this year. And it continues to be just impressive, impressive groups of applicants that come in and we get to learn and understand uh, new companies and how they're trying to solve old and complex problems embedded deeply within the construction industry and ecosystem. And we're really excited to help those companies overcome their largest challenge and, and go out to market and be extremely successful. Yeah, it, it sounds like a really fantastic program. And, you know, it's, it's funny you said, who's the next one? Because I'm, I'm curious, too, what's the long term vision here, right? I think you guys have done a great job of bringing these opportunities, combining industry with the technology and creating, you know, a, a safe space for those to intersect and really try to understand one another and, and benefit each other. But what's the long term goal with the Boost program? Is this something that you see running indefinitely? Are you going to grow from this? Yeah, so I think um, I think two things. One is it's going to be running indefinitely. I think every year it will change a little bit based on what we're mm -hmm. hearing and feeling in the market. But I think the the general concept of the program being highly focused, highly efficient, highly effective, and measurable to make sure we are delivering true value to our founders. Um, we would never want to ask them for their time if we don't think it would be worthwhile for them. So those so kind of the underpinnings of the program will remain the same. There are a few things that are in the works this year. And I think that, you know, when we when we launch the program this year, we'll begin to talk to our founders about that. But our Suffolk team is actually opening up our innovation campus, which is actually right behind our main headquarters here in Boston. It's about 15,000 square feet. Um, it's where our Suffolk Technologies team will sit. It's where our Suffolk Illuminate team will sit. That's a team of about 15 architects right now who are working mm -hmm. on more of the design uh, process. And then also we have our Suffolk Capital team, which does real estate investments alongside some of our uh, commercial clients. And so having all of us over in the building behind us is going to be really exciting. And in that, we are opening up a co-working space. And so the idea will be if six weeks is not enough time for you guys to solve the problem and you want to continue that longstanding relationship with Suffolk, you know, we're going to have plenty of desks. We want you guys to come and work here with us. Obviously, the location being in Boston is fantastic. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of inbound from HBS and MIT alums who want to come work with us or just spend the summer with us if they're getting another degree. And what we want to be and what we continue to serve as is kind of this melting pot of expertise. So, we have venture capital partners, we have real estate partners, we have architecture partners, we have civil engineers, we have structural engineers, we have our Suffolk construction teams, we have the old ways of planning, we have the new younger kids that want to innovate and, and do mm -hmm. everything on their iPhones. And the idea is we wanted to create a space where everybody feels like they can foster their own innovation and ideas and bounce ideas off of one another. And so we are creating a physical space behind us as we speak. Um, our team moves in in about two weeks, and that innovation center will open in earnest in the fall, which we're extremely excited about. And so that will kind of be more of an iteration on the program, such as say mm -hmm. the Boost program will still be short, succinct, efficient, and effective. But we're also going to have the ability to say, if you want to spend more time with us, we would love to have you here. And we have a space designated for you to be here to interact with us and call on us as you see fit. And really what we think that that kind of incubation space and co-working space is going to serve as is going to help companies accelerate through uh, a growth phase. And so what we like to do is work with those early pre-seed, seed, and series A companies and help them double, triple, 10x their revenue in a shorter period of time. 
and having a physical space where we can have, you know, the, the groups that I, that I laid out earlier and our superintendents and project managers be there. The goal is to, is to help these companies get product market fit faster, establish their pricing model correctly and in the right way. And the goal of this, of this working space behind us, our innovation center, is that we'll be able to pressure test that in real time with these right. companies. And so you lose you lose any of the of the the time spent kind of iterating on different pricing models or trying with four or five different clients. And one of the things that's most unique in the construction innovation uh, ecosystem is is the the life cycle of a project. An average an average project might be eighteen or twenty four months. And so if you miss it on the first on the first go around to get onto a project, you might not get another shot to get on that on that project executive's job for another two years, maybe two and a mm-hmm. half in some cases. So why we want to have kind of a centralized hub where we can be pulling on a lot of different industry partners and also on the Suffolk ecosystem as a whole is just to speed up on that iteration cycle. And so you're not waiting 18 or 24 months to try something new. You can try three or four at once. And so you get where you want to be as far as product market fit and pricing in a much shorter and, and condensed timeline, which allows you to grow faster. And ultimately, you know, you put up that defensive moat and you become the leader in that space or in that sector that you're trying to be. So we think that that's super important to help these, these you know, very successful founders find product market fit and pricing and the right way to sell and accelerate quickly. And we want to be here to be their partner for that. Yeah, it's truly a, a melting pot, right? It, it's a think tank. It's the, an actual space dedicated to that. It's not just a process, but it's an actual place. And I, it's very fortunate uh, and maybe designed that way. You're in Boston, right? And you've got such a unique blend of universities up there, whether you're talking MIT, Harvard, Northeastern, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of thinking power, right? You mentioned bringing some of those newer ideas. Is there an effort to bring in maybe some of the, the younger people from those universities and try to work with them as well? Or, you know, is it just kind of a happy circumstance? No, so there, there is an effort. We put a lot of effort into, into mostly everything that we do. And actually this year, that, that kind of program is piloting this summer. And so we actually are onboarding a few summer interns at both HBS and MIT. And they will be spending the summer with us in our new innovation campus and helping us actually helping us iron out what the program should look like going forward. Because, you know, when we have the ability to, to work with the people that we're trying to serve and ask them to help us sculpt a program, that's mm-hmm. when we're going to have the best results. And so, right. um, you know, very similarly to, to why we run the Boost program is, you know, to put those experts around the table. And so instead of you pontificating or hypothesizing about if the client would like it or if the architect would like something, you know, we're like, hey, we, we have them right here. Let's just ask them now. And so you guys don't waste any time. So this summer is, is actually going to be our first kind of pilot summer um, running our co-working space out of our innovation center. Uh, and we're extremely excited about it. One of the companies that's coming to work with us this summer is actually a sustainable building material company. And, and so that is going to be uh, super interesting. And again, I think that's par for the times. And our company is putting quite a bit of emphasis behind, you know, making sure that we're doing our part. And in the city of Boston with our, our carbon goals as well, it's going to be uh, more and more and more important as we start working through these next couple iterations of innovation. So uh, we want to keep that on the forefront. Yeah, agreed. We just had a couple of members of Zurich's senior leadership team coming on, Patrick McBride and David Etsy. They talked a lot about that and the combination between the environmental goals, whether that's going to be upcoming uh, legislation or requirements, but also just a desire, right? The the market is calling for this. And so it's it's interesting to hear you talk about that. We'll have to link you guys up together. But with that being said, Parker, we've, we've spent some time thinking about who we're bringing in, but I have a question for you then. How does Suffolk decide internally who do they assign to this process, right? You're, you're talking about mentors and, and bringing people with varying degrees of expertise from Suffolk. So how do you guys go about selecting who that, that mentor will be and, and partnering people up? Absolutely. So we have been running with this concept that is called our Innovations Champion Network. Um, that was set up about four years ago. It is a 100% voluntary opt-in group that sits within Suffolk and within our innovation team at Suffolk. Anybody can be a part of it. It is 
predominantly, I would say it's 85% or so uh, superintendents and project managers. The group has over 200 people within the Suffolk community who have opted to be a part of that. That's, you know, roughly 10, 12% of the folks that work at Suffolk. So it's pretty significant, the buy-in that we have there. And actually, we just, we go to that group first and ask them who would like to be involved with the Boost program. It's typically an overwhelmingly positive wave of folks who want to be involved. You know, once we, once we spill out some of the scheduling conflicts and what it looks like to be a Boost captain or be on one of the Boost mentorship teams, uh, a few folks will drop out for various reasons. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you know, the, the job site comes first and we want to make sure these right. folks have the, the appropriate amount of time to help these companies succeed. And so that's where we go to first. And that group ranges from new hires, some people with technological backgrounds, you know, all the way to folks who have been with Suffolk for 30, 35, 40 years even. So we have a, a very wide range um, that, that are in that group. And so for us to run the Boost program on an annual basis, we will pull from that diverse group and make sure that we have the right mentorship team surrounding each of the companies, dependent upon what they are trying to solve in that in that particular Boost program. So for the example last year that we mentioned with Nifty, who was in the program, you know, they wanted to look at, at revamping their pricing model. For us, what that meant is let's make sure that we have a few construction solutions directors around the table who can be a part of that mentorship team who see, you know, 100 or 150 tech solutions annually and know where kind of the right price point is for certain offerings. And so we will ch- we will cherry pick to make sure that we surround the companies that are accepting right. the program with the most appropriate mentorship team. Yeah, you, you got to put people in a position to succeed. So that, there's, a, there's a constant effort there. And Absolutely. I imagine that, I mean, you're going to have some really interesting conversations there. And I know you've alluded to a little bit with the, uh, you know, the environmental and, and the sustainability things. But if you were giving a prediction, right, what do you think the, the trend's going to be maybe this year, maybe even moving forward? What do you think that would be? What are you seeing? I think we're finally at a point where there are, Great solutions coming to the market. And you know, another plug is is for WINT, which was in the program last year. That's a, a, a water leak detection and mitigation system. They also uh, track total water consumption within buildings. That ties very directly back to carbon and carbon emissions, actually, because of the, the energy required to actually get water into a building. And if, when you're wasting a lot of water, that t- does nothing but increase the carbon emissions of a building. And they've done a great job at drawing that correlation. So I think what we're seeing now is there is actually a pretty large pool of companies who are actually now able to measure how effective they can be when installed into a building or when included in the in the construction process of a building. And that measurable output is starting to be more tangible and actually allows our clients now to make more informed decisions. So in the past, I think for a lot of our clients, it felt like you know they were the guinea pig or they were piloting some new green sustainability process in construction or a new technology that was going to help them uh, you know, reduce waste, reduce carbon emissions. And it was difficult to measure, or at least difficult to measure like for like. And I think now with some of the, the more corporate and, and governance around ESG and sustainability, especially within the built environment, the ability for these younger startups to help uh, report their efficiency gains has really helped bring those solutions up and have allowed our clients to make more informed decisions, such as to say, we know what we're paying for the solution, but we also know that the output we're getting from this solution is worth it. And you can track that in carbon emissions, in water savings, in cost savings, in kilowatt hour savings, whatever you really want to be doing as a client. You now have the capability to measure that. Um, and we say a lot here, if you, if you can't manage it, you can't, or you can't measure it, you can't manage it, right? And so for us, having the ability to really dial in measurements within the construction and sustainability world, I think is going to really help these things take off over the next few years. So uh, we're really excited to, to kind of help foster that through the process. And again, like I said, I think we're just scratching at the surface and there's going to be a lot more innovation um, within sustainability and construction uh, over the next couple of years. Yeah, I, I, I think that the, one of the through lines we're seeing when we're having these conversations, it's there's always been benefit, right? But it's been hard to see at times yeah. with the technology. And, and through that, what I feel like we're kind of, the, the wheels are about to get some traction is that we've got the technology now to really show exactly. And like you're saying, you can measure these things now, totally. to show the direct correlation to the dotted line and say, well, this is this is the benefit. This is it right here. And with that, you get a lot of buy-in right from the top down from an organization. 
So speaking of drawing some, some lines and correlation, we do like to, to give our audience three takeaways typically with each episode. With that, I would ask, you know, if I'm listening to this episode right now, what would your big three takeaways be for uh, anyone listening to this, trying to figure out how they want to innovate and, and maybe go into a group like this? Sure. I think um, I think one of the, the the first and probably the largest takeaway is that innovating in the construction industry uh, requires buy-in and absolute alignment across all stakeholders. That word alignment across stakeholders is something that uh, is seemingly is taboo within the construction world. We are very rarely aligned uh, from an incentive standpoint with the insurance carrier, with the architects, the engineers, and the clients. And so what we're what again that the impetus kind of behind the boost program was to say. Let's make sure that we have alignment from our industry partners that we're asking to be to take part in the program. And when we raise a small fund on the side and deposit you know, small equity checks into the companies that come through, all of a sudden we have a great sense of alignment and more driven purpose. So I think the first one I would say that innovating in the construction industry definitely requires that buy-in and alignment across stakeholders. Number two would be learn to fail fast and don't be afraid to fail. It happens quickly. We have seen quite a few companies over the past year or so, you know, who have been facing bankruptcy at some point or another. And the beauty of it is that it happened very quickly, right? And so maybe they started to grow a revenue stream and made the decision that it was never going to get to where they needed the company to be. And so they shut it down quickly and then could ha- still have the run rate to innovate and try something new. And so I'd say number two is to learn, learn to fail fast and don't be afraid to fail. And then third thing I would say, um, and something that's near and dear to the hearts of the folks that work at Suffolk, is this concept of reverse mentorship. That is somebody who's newer in the industry, and I'll say I still am because only having seven years of construction experience is not nearly what some of the folks at Suffolk have. So I absolutely learn from some of the folks who have 30 or 40 years of experience. And in that same learning, there's quite a bit that somebody who's been in the industry for 30 or 40 years can learn from somebody like me who is challenging the status quo in the way that we've been supposed to be building buildings just because it's worked over the past, you know, 150, 200 years, whatever it is. So for me, I always I always like to, to push that idea of reverse mentorship and make sure that, that the younger generations don't lose track over the fact that it's okay, be comfortable pushing the limits, be comfortable pushing the status quo because... Um, those efficiency gains is ultimately what's going to advance the entire construction industry forward. And that's the goal that we have at Suffolk Technologies. So that would be my three takeaways. Yeah, I love it. And I especially love the, the learn to fail quickly. In so many things, a quick no sometimes is better than a long maybe. Absolutely. And it can absolutely help you reposition, pivot, make those decisions quickly, like you're saying, and maybe find success, you know, but rather than a long process and then just ending up with nothing. So another thing then, Parker, we also like to give an action item. So great takeaways, but if if you're looking to do something today, tomorrow, maybe change the way you're thinking or approach a problem differently, what would be that first step that you would advise as an action item for someone to do? I think a first first action item I would do would be to look and understand the data sets that are now able to be gleaned from construction sites. I think this is something that's really started to evolve over the last five years. And our chief data officer at Suffolk, Jiki Chin, who also works with our Suffolk Technologies team, has been hard at work with it. You know, we have a team, we have a team of, of over 25 data scientists at Suffolk. And so the ability to now clean data, clean data from our job sites and standardize that into data sets and so you can actually analyze it. And now we're starting to see the ability to actually act upon the data. And so it's always been, how do we extract the data? And then it was, okay, how do we clean the data and compare the data like for like? And now it's, what actions can we take on the data? And so if I were coming into this ecosystem fresh, or I want to come up with a new innovative construction technology idea, I would start to base my understanding of construction around now, what are we, what are we doing with the data sets that we have and how can we both be more actionable or be proactive? And I like to say be predictive, but I think that there's a step in between there and that's being proactive on the data that we have because that's going to continue to iterate and that's only going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And that also is an insatiable appetite that our general contractors have, that our clients especially have, and then operators of the building because, you know, data is going to be king moving forward. And the the more you can understand about the way that your building behaves, um, the way people interact with your building, the way your building was constructed, 
you know, that allows you to make more informed and smarter decisions. And so I think that, that I would say, you know, double down the, on the data sets that are available for you right now and try to think about where the puck is going because it's moving so quickly that solving for a problem here and now today in two or three months might actually become obsolete. We're really, really moving quick. So um, try to put on, you know, kind of that, that, that hat to say, you know, where do I think this thing is going in the next five to six months? Excellent. Yeah. So, <laughs> Parker, as we wrap this up, it's been really great to communicate with you and to speak with you today. We always like to ask a couple rapid fire questions. So if, you, sure. if you're ready, uh, we're going to hit you quick. I think I have a good idea about this one. But, you know, what gets you most energized about the industry right now? It seems like everything does, the, the questions, everything. But if you had to pick one, what, what gets you the most energized? I think it's the ability for the, the older generation, folks that have grown up within the construction industry now to take risks and, and want to innovate. Like that for me is something that's most exciting. I think something like the boost program could have easily kind of been shut down by our, by the Suffolk construction arm of folks that are like, listen, we've been doing it the same way, but instead it was welcomed with, uh, with open arms and people get really excited about it every year. You know, last year was the first year we were able to have the, uh, boost demo day in person and this, seeing the Suffolk Stadium filled up with folks who have been working in construction for that long was amazing. So I think the ability for the older generation to take risks and be willing to, to you know, welcome innovation with open arms is, is most exciting. Speaking of that, of that experience, do you have any mentors for yourself that helped you along the way get to, to where you are now? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, there's a few along the way. I, I think I've been very fortunate to have our CEO and founder, John Fish, as a close mentor of mine since I began working at Suffolk. His ability to always want to challenge the status quo, and, and oftentimes he, will, he has this line where he'll say, tell someone to finish his sentence, and he'll be very open and understanding in the fact that he might not know what needs to be done, but he understands the vision of what has to happen, and he'll say, like, come on, somebody, somebody here finished my sentence. And so yeah, the openness to hear what other people around the table think and his ability to push people to think differently and challenge that status quo is, is you know, something that I will be uh, forever thankful for. And, and that absolutely can, gets me out of bed in the morning as well. That is a, a dynamic way to, uh, to operate. And I, I can definitely see the benefit there. So then finally, and maybe, maybe I'll, I'll ask you to finish my sentence. What is something, Parker, that people will be surprised to hear about you? I think something that people are surprised to hear about me is actually my first internship ever. I joined an Australian Great White Shark research team based out of South Africa. That was a little bit, obviously, my career took a few different turns after that, but I was a marine biologist in college, and so I thought my calling was to be uh, on a research boat day in and out. And so my first experience, my first work experience was tagging great white sharks in South Africa. Okay, follow-up questions here. Did, did, <laughs> were you in the water? Were you in the cage? Or were you like tagging? Like, is, are you talking Shark Week kind of stuff? It's both. It's, it's a combination of, of, of all sorts of things. But it was, we were in the cage some days with the camera. We were on a boat some days tagging sharks. Some days we were towing decoys that had different colors on the bottom to see if the sharks wanted to eat something more than a different color. So we did we did all sorts of, of work with those great whites and, and got awfully close to them, which um, you know I no longer have have an immense fear of them. So mm -hmm. um, some people will call me silly for that, but that's just kind of what happens when you're around them for so long. Wow, that that is something that's on my bucket list to do. But it sounds like uh, I know someone now. I can I take some pointers how not to get eaten. You are still here, uh, you know, all fingers and toes. So that's excellent. I think I um, maybe I just, I just can't get away from uh, from sharks. I guess because people now uh, equate our boost program to Shark Week, uh, or excuse me, to Shark Tank. Um, okay, so Shark it, Tank. Yeah, it feels like it feels like Shark Tank. You know, when we come in for demo day, and so. Uh, Maybe there's something about it that, that hasn't fully left the system yet, but I don't get to talk about great whites all that much in my day to day. Yeah, you know, uh, I would not have. I would. I would. Ne I, honestly, I would. I'm at a loss for words. I would have never guessed that that you were doing that. That's pretty awesome. So then, lastly, before we wrap this up, you know, this is the building fight. Stands for BIM Insurance Technologies with the experts. You're our expert. Now, I've lived in Boston before. I know you're up there. Where are you taking a bite at today? You know, is it Honest Taqueria? Is it Jim's Deli? Like, what's, what's the number one thing for you? It is a hole-in-the-wall Italian restaurant in the very Irish community of South Boston called Cafe Portobello. It sounds funny. The, the women working there all have um, kind of Southie Irish accents, but they serve amazing homemade Italian food. So 
it is fantastic, and I will be getting their chicken parm again tonight. So not the north end for the That's Italian right. food. You go to Southie for the Italian food. Okay. That's right. That's right. Okay. Give it a shot. Well, I, I certainly will next time I'm up there. So, Parker, it's been great connecting with you today. If our listeners want to connect with you, where can they find you? Yeah, I think uh, LinkedIn is definitely the best. Parker Munt, uh, it's M-U-N-D-T. And uh, I look forward to connecting with, with anybody who, uh, who wants to talk about construction technology, wants to talk about sharks, wants to talk about our boost program. Always open to new conversations and, uh, you know, love, love to have them. So please feel free to drop me a note and uh, we'll get connected. Thank you very much for joining us today, Parker. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to The Building Bite. This podcast has been brought to you by Proactive. Check us out on thebuildingbite.com, where you can subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media for all future The Building Bite news and updates. You can also find us on your favorite apps, including Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Amazon. If you have ideas for episode topics that we should cover on the show, or you know somebody who would be a perfect guest, let us know at connect at buildingbite.com.